Welcome back to The Real News Network and Reality Asserts Itself. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our discussion with Eddie Conway about his life and his efforts to organize the Black Panther Party in Baltimore and then organize in jails. And he ain't stopped yet. We're now picking up the story of the Black Panther Party in 1968-69. In his book, Martial Law, The Life and Times of a Baltimore Black Panther, Eddie writes, soon we were demonstrating at Memorial Stadium against Nixon's destructive domestic and foreign policies because both were having an impact on our communities. The simple fact of sisters and brothers coming together on a regular basis to work for the community and expand their knowledge brought a new level of consciousness to the group. It was during this time that we began to see that there was a movement afoot to dismantle the progress of the BPP, the Black Panther Party. A little further down, Eddie Conway writes, It was the start of what would soon become weekly police harassment of the Baltimore Black Panther Party. Our members were being arrested in ever-increasing numbers for minor things, and this soon escalated from situations like traffic stops and violations to some of our members facing charges for burglaries and robberies, and eventually homicide. The alleged murder of police officers would soon take the place of the mythological rape of white women as the basis for the legal lynching of black men. Now joining us in the studio is Eddie Conway. Thanks very much for joining us. Okay, thanks for having me back. So in, in the book, you write about uh, an American form of fascism that was developing around this time, uh, targeting Black Panthers and other progressive organizations. Uh, wh why do you use that kind of terminology? Well, because it was a, a relationship between the media, all the law enforcement agencies. At the time, we didn't understand what that program actually was, but uh, we were being harassed uh, on our jobs. We were being harassed uh, due to uh, tax codes. We, uh, we were being harassed through uh, uh, just local entities trying to uh, take us out of our houses, uh, the places that we were renting, uh, so there was a concerted effort, but that effort also crossed the line in uh, stories that were being planted in the newspaper about us, uh, the way in which we were being treated when we went uh, through the uh, criminal uh, justice system. Uh, and there was a, le as we know, we talked earlier about mm -hmm. COINTELPRO, mm -hmm. a really national coordinated campaign of all the police agencies, and with the Panthers being the primary target, including mm -hmm. letter writing to try to sow dissension. Mm -hmm. But how did this show up in Baltimore? Well, actually, it showed up. It's, it's strange because it initially showed up, and we, what we weren't aware of it, is that the the Merlin chapter of the Black Panther Party was actually created by an uh, agent provocateur named uh, Warren Hart, and he uh, worked for the National Security Agency. How did you determine he was NSA versus FBI or something? Well, we determined that after we investigated him. Uh, a, a series of incidents took place uh, uh, in which Panthers got locked up, or uh, uh, Panthers were going uh, uh, on field trips. We were organizing at that time. We were organized the uh, the D.C. Panthers. We were organizing up in Pennsylvania. Uh, so we were sending uh, crews in those areas to uh, to organize and educate in the communities. Uh, we would send eight cars, say for instance, uh, somewhere with. Uh, uh, 16 people in them, and seven cars would come back, uh, um, 14 people, uh, two people would be missing, a car would be missing, we never would be able to determine what happened. Somewhere along the line, they got snatched off the highway, got locked up for some reason or another. Uh, there was no follow-up, no investigation. People just, just literally disappeared on us. And this guy, uh, Hart, was supposed to be responsible for Hart defense. Hart was yeah. in charge of the whole process. And then there were people in our offices in various uh, uh, capacities over interviewing somebody. They were in areas that they shouldn't have been in, uh, areas that were restricted to uh, the public. But this uh, is how you uncovered that he was a police agent, but how'd you figure yeah. out he was NSA? We didn't figure that out right away. Uh, once, once it was determined that he wasn't who he said he was, and once it was determined that he didn't live where he was supposed to, 
uh, they actually sent a team of investigators. They being and, the leadership in Oakland. Yes, uh, national leadership sent a team of investigators, some lawyers and some, some actual investigators. And in the process of investigating him, he fled. And uh, it was only later, and as he fled, we obviously we labeled him as a, a police agent provocateur, a police informer. At that time, we did not know he was national security. Uh, but then apparently he infiltrated uh, Stokely Carmichael's organization up in Canada, uh, the All People's uh, Revolutionary Party, and uh, formatted uh, trouble up there and tried to get people locked up. And I think even one of the incidents might inv have involved Angela Davis. Um, and then later he went to the Caribbean. And somewhere in that process, um, he was identified as a national security agent. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the things you were organizing at the time was mm -hmm. the breakfast program. This was one mm -hmm. of the main pillars of Panther activity across mm -hmm. the country, and you were mm -hmm. doing it in Baltimore. Uh, mm -hmm. In your book, you write a, about a memo that Hoover, uh, it was discovered later, Hoover had written. Mm -hmm. There was always real pressure on supporters to stop assisting the program, meaning the, bre the breakfast program. A 1969 memo from J. Edgar Hoover to 24 FBI offices stated, quote, the free breakfast program represents the best and most influential activity going on for the BPP, and as such is potentially the greatest threat to efforts by authorities to neutralize the BPP and destroy what it stands for. Why were they, of all things, so concerned about a breakfast, handing out food to kids in the morning? Well, I, I think one of the things that, that was important about the way in which the Black Panther Party organized at that time was that it did put out a newspaper, it did have a lot of theory about socialist activities and socialist uh, practices, but I think the thing that resonated in the black communities was the actual practical application of those theories in terms of harnessing the resources in the community, bringing people together, uh, to take care of yourself, uh, to feed the children. Now, once we discovered uh, that uh, children were hungry, it, it, it kind of it was on a two-tier level. On one level, it was like, okay, this is how we can deal with that problem. On another level, it was an international embarrassment for America that you would open the doors to a breakfast program and 300 children would flood in every morning because they was hungry. And, and for the richest country in the world to have that kind of hunger and poverty throughout the land was an international embarrassment in, in and of itself. And so it, 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 one, it represented socialism actually in theory and practice, and it showed people how to apply it. And on the other hand, it was an embarrassment for international capitalism. And, and I, there's, a, I think, another quote from Hoover where they talk about how concerned they are about the growing popularity of the, of the Panthers. Mm -hmm. And I guess the Breakfast Program helped build such a, a large piece of that popularity. Well, in, in, in fact, uh, uh, all through my time in the prison system, I was constantly approached by people that had ate at the Breakfast Program. That, had, uh, that was like grateful for the fact that the breakfast program had existed. So what did the FBI do to try to undermine the breakfast program? Well, they did a number of things. They tried to reach the donors. I mean, you know, we constantly were soliciting uh, eggs, food, paper plates, et cetera, bread, so on. Uh, so they, they constantly tried to reach the merchants and the associate, but they also tried to and they did a couple of things. They, they put out a, uh, what I call a poison pen comic book uh, that was supposedly put out by the Black Panther Party uh, and supposedly distributed to young children at the breakfast yeah, program. So this is a comic book. Yeah, that, that will say kill the police yeah, or kill the this or off the pig or that kind of stuff. And it, came, and it did come out later that the FBI created the yeah, comic book. Yeah, yeah, it did. But then they used that and they used similar stories like that they planted in newspapers to show that uh, there was propaganda being uh, 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 pumped into the breakfast program through the Black Panther Party uh, uh, toward the young people and so on. 
and they tried to turn people in the community against sending their children to the breakfast program, but children were hungry and people in the community, they recognized that they needed to have that kind of a program so that their children could at least learn in school. Well, as I said a little earlier, uh, you wrote in your book that there was a form of American fascism mm -hmm. developing. Mm -hmm. You know, not SS troops, but, mm -hmm. uh, but an American form of it. Mm -hmm. and, and in 1969, the Panthers ordered a, a, organized a conference to talk or debate the mm -hmm. nature of American fascism. And mm -hmm. It's held in Oakland? It's held in so, Oakland So what in was July. the debate? You, you write it was a debate. So what was the debate? Well, uh, the debate was, I mean, you know, the, and, and this is the discussion that always takes, have taken place throughout the history in America, whether or not there is fascism, because there was no Nazi uniforms, or there was no SS or, or, or no apparent Gestapo. Um, and of course, those uh, organizations that were revolutionary, that were suffering uh, repression, uh, 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 were, were suffering from uh, police attacks and, and et cetera, seemed to be crazy to a lot of people that were even on the left. They were like, oh, you know, it's not really that bad, you know, or y'all bringing it on yourself, or y'all really paranoid. They're not really watching you, they're not listening. Uh, and, but pretty much what we were saying was that it, it was almost because fascism is one of those kind of political apparatuses that takes the form of the particular country and its history. In Spain, it was uh, that whole uh, phalange or whatever it was movement. In um, probably in Argentina, it was probably Peron. Um, Mussolini and, in Italy. Yeah, Mussolini in Italy. So it, it, each country had its own appearance. Right? Let, me, let me read and another we, quote from the book, okay. which kind of points mm -hmm. in this direction. Mm -hmm. uh, Eddie writes, we could not have known it then, but the country would soon learn that the FBI and other state and local agencies were in fact functioning as a national secret police. But unfortunately, by the time that information became public, many of us would have already fallen victim to these covert operations. And as we know, that was COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and and I always maintain that if, if there's some sort of automatic democratic fascism, and I don't know whether that's it's it's a right terminology, but basically what I'm saying is that that the whole promise keepers ideas, the whole right wing, uh, or, or white supremacy kind of movement, it, it's all uh, hell's angels, whatever. It's almost uh, like a self-imposed fascist attitude. It's us against the world. It's us, if you're not with us, then you're opposed to us. You know, you have to uh, wear the flag, you have to stand up uh, the whole nine yards. And if you're not doing that, then we're gonna isolate you or ostracize you. You know, and, it, and it's almost like the McCarthy era dressed up. Yeah, the, this idea of white supremacism supremacism is, is very much, con you know, the roots of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a series recently with mm -hmm. Gerald Horn. Mm -hmm. You know, it's to get the white working class on the side of the white elites mm -hmm. and say, we're all, we're all together because we're all white. And the mm -hmm. problem are, mm -hmm. you know, at the time, uh, you know, African slaves, and now it's black workers. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the ability or the attempt to create the Panthers as this kind of continuation mm -hmm. of the, you know, the black threat. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about that. Well, see, and, and that's, that's really something that where there was a, a major conflict with the, uh, with the reality and what was being presented. Uh, there was always this effort to present the Black Panthers as a black nationalist hate group or an armed black militant group that was anti-white. And uh, the practice on the ground was that there were uh, white Panthers. They were, a uh, relationship between the anti-war movement and the Panthers. It was a relationship between the Panthers and SDS. Uh, and there uh, was uh, the Patriot Party that was an all-white uh, uh, grassroots uh, revolutionary organization. All of them were connected to and worked with the Panther Party, along with the Brown Berets, the, uh, uh, which were a uh, Mexican-American uh, revolutionary uh, group, uh, along with the uh, Young Lords, which was Puerto Ricans, along with the American Indian Movement, AIM. Uh, 
because of that relationship on the ground and in practice, it was hard, it was hard to uh, target the Panthers as black nationalists, a black nationalist hate group, but still the FBI and the law enforcement agencies managed to use the media and um, the written media mostly to present that and to portray that. I mean, and that, that, uh, that image is still in existence in people's heads today when you ask them about what was the Black Panthers. There, there was a, a group that came up, I, I, I can't remember if it was a, a split off of the Panthers or a separate group, US I think it was called. No, there, there was a, I, I cringe when you do that. So there, was, there, there was a group called US, uh, Ron Karanga's Stood for organization. United Slaves. Stood for United Slaves. It was never part of the Black Panther Party. But I believe it did have its uh, uh, roots in uh, a, a, a matter of fact, it did probably have its roots in the uh, San Francisco Black Panther Party group that sprung up across from Oakland that eventually got chased out of San Francisco. Yeah, and then it started uh, a, a and, quite a debate and fight. Yeah. And they and were, they they were, were very cultural nationalists yeah. and they don't were, work with whites and such. They don't, didn't work with whites. They were uh, uh, advocating uh, uh, cultural nationalist uh, clothes, uh, back to Africa, the, the warrior uh, principles, uh, basically the to, to recapture the uh, black culture from the 15th century before the advent of slavery uh, and to go back there and to start and build from there. Uh, and it, they were very hostile to the uh, Black Panther it became, Party. It became a shootout at some point. Yeah, a couple well, of Panthers yeah, were killed. Yeah, yeah. Panthers were assassinated Angeles, by that think, group yeah. in Los Angeles and in other places, uh, uh, San Diego and so on. And how much did uh, COINTELPRO and the cops have to do with this? Well, the L.A. PD. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure it, we could di directly connect it to COINTELPRO, but the Los Angeles Police Department orchestrated most of that stuff. And I think a guy named Louis Tack would uh, end up doing something called the Glass House Tapes, and he kind of exposed that. Yeah, we, we did a series of interviews with David K. Johnson, an investigative journalist, mm -hmm. who did a big ex expose of the LAPD during this period. Okay. They apparently had more than 300 people involved in infiltrating uh, yeah. Black Panthers and other yeah. progressive yeah. groups. And they orchestrated and manipulated U.S. Uh, to uh, attack the Black Panthers. They uh, And in some cases now, as I think about it, uh, there's actually documents in the COINTELPRO papers. In fact, I, I have some of them in my book. Uh, the first book, that, The Greatest Threat. Yeah, yeah, and The Greatest Threat, that actually shows that they, they did encourage uh, conflicts between U.S. and the Panthers, and they, uh, some of the memos said we actually told them where there would be Panther meetings at and so on. And uh, in the case of New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, I believe it was, they were actually trying to encourage U.S. members to attack Black Panther Party members. Uh, and uh, that's part of it. COINTELPRO papers. We know a lot about COINTELPRO because there was a, there was a break in an FBI office and they got hold of a bunch of the files. This is in uh, 71. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this came out. And then the church committee also came out and uh, investigated this. So it's not like this is like some kind of conspiracy theory. This is all pretty well documented, COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. I, but I thought you made a very interesting comment in, in your book about this coordinated national police activity, which was FBI, NSA, local police forces. Mm -hmm. Speaking about the discovery in 1971, you write that that discovery was followed by a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit that produced more evidence demonstrating the program's scope. Officially, COINTELPRO operated from 1956 to 1971, and officially the program continued under other names and was most recently codified as the U.S. Patriot Act. So this ain't over. Yeah, what, uh, I think the church committee said, okay, these acts were illegal, uh, and they, they listed uh, dozens and dozens of things that the FBI had done during that period that were actually illegal. Uh, the Patriot Act found all of those things and put them in the Patriot Act and made them law so that they could be, uh, you know, uh, done legally. Uh, 
And no, it's not over. Now it's just officially, it's okay. And, and, and the fact that it's okay now is not really strange because the same thing happened uh, at the end of the McCarthy era. They found out what McCarthy did wrong and what was, what could be corrected, and then they made it legal. Uh, and prior to that, uh, during the, uh, the attacks against the union organizing in the, uh, uh, in the 30s and so on, they codified those things and made them legal. You know, so I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's the, the habit of the American government to, to kind of say, okay, we made a mistake, uh, it's just a one-time thing, we violated people's rights, it won't happen again, you know, we'll, we'll put everything in check and then they'll go back and a couple years later, new laws will come out and those laws will justify whatever that behavior was and then from then on in, that's no longer a mistake, and the next time it happens, it's something different. Uh, or torture, say, for instance, yeah. you know, or uh, enhanced interrogation. Yeah. Uh, and at some point, it, that becomes, well, okay, that's legal. Well, according. when there's no accountability yeah. and nobody pays yeah. the price, you know. Or, or, or the, the black op sites or the black sites in which people go to prison uh, and they don't have any rights or or any uh, ability to have representation or any of that kind of stuff is justified under uh, an act of war that doesn't exist, you know. Right, okay. We're to be continued. Thanks for joining us. Okay. And thank you for joining us. Uh, join us for the next segment of our series of Reality Asserts Itself with Eddie Conway on The Real News Network.